we're doing for high content value, low production value. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the art of aperitif. Happy hour conversations with artists to whet your creative appetite. I'm your host, Emily Vikra. Today's guest is Natalie Salmonen, a painter, sculptor, and poet based in Duluth, Minnesota. In today's episode, we talk about her primary medium, encaustic, which is an ancient style of painting with wax, about trusting yourself in the process, and about embracing layers. Welcome to the show, Natalie. I love the sound of the dump trucks outside. <laughs> it's very industrial. Yeah. Like the maker's, maker's space. Maker's, maker's space. Yeah. Um, well, let's pretend this is at the start of the video. Do you want to you introduce yourself, Natalie? Yes. My name is Natalie Solomon Rude. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I am a visual artist in Duluth, Minnesota. What else should I tell you? Yeah, well, visual artist and so much more. Poet, storyteller. It's mom. Mom, yes. So tell me a little bit about finding your way into being an artist. Is that something that was always there? Always a calling? Was it something you found your way into? No, it's a great, it's a great story. I didn't, I didn't really know. I mean, I felt like I had a very strong visual sort of, um, what's the word? Like, convictions. <laughs> when I was five, my mother yeah. tells me this. I looked her up and down before leaving for kindergarten, and I said, "You're gonna wear that." <laughs> Like, I'm not a fashion, you know, guru, but it was, I have these visual sort of things that were guiding me along. And then in high school, you know, my art teacher was like, you're on something, you need to stick with this. But I never saw myself as an artist. And I think looking back, it's just, I didn't have enough artists around me. I just didn't really know that it was... Mm -hmm. I think so I love to talk to people about being an artist and I love to talk to kids and young adults like this is possible you can be an artist you can make a living mm -hmm. I really didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up but because I knew all the things I didn't want to be mm -hmm. it just sort of left me in a tricky spot although then what am I going to go to school for like I know I need a degree but there's nothing that would hold me in a classroom, but I knew that art would, so I went to school for art, dropped out, traveled, went back to school, finished my art degree, but still at that point was like, I don't know what I want to do. And then at 27 or 26, I discovered midwifery. And I was like, this is it? This is it, and it sort of, um, it just made space for all the things that I was interested in. And this particular midwifery program that I found did all clinicals overseas, and that was a way that I could sort of travel and experience, you know, different kinds of living. So I was all excited about that. So after school, I did some more traveling down to South America, and I was down there for about six months, and I... In the meantime, those early 20 years were like ragingly destructive, mm -hmm. like fun, mm -hmm. but I was just kind of spinning out of control. And so I had this prayer, like, God, you've got to like pick me up and drop me off somewhere else because I can't get out of this lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I know. It was really, really, really intense. And, um, he did. He dropped me off in the middle of the Everglades all by myself. It was crazy. Like, I ran out of money in South America. I met with a travel agent in Tegucigalpa, Honduras. She was able to get me a final ticket to Miami. She said, I can't get you to Minnesota, but I can get you to Miami. Starts with an M. So I got to Miami. I had a friend who lived like an hour from the airport. Her husband was a firefighter was working in the Big Cypress National Preserve and there happened to be this little gallery there of a photographer 
who shot The Last of Wild Florida. And so mm-hmm. he wanted his gallery, you know, right next to the subject matter. But it was too far for employees to commute. So he had all these random, crazy kind of living spaces, like a landlocked houseboat was one of them for employees. <laughs> there was a trailer that he cut the front off of and then built on a living room. So you had your kitchen and your bath and your bedroom in the trailer, and then you had this big, beautiful, expansive living room. So, And I ended up in a, a little, what they call, TED shed. So it's like a tool shed, and I think they put three of them together. Um, so I, I had this little shed that my friend had been living in, her, she and her husband and their son, and two days after I got there, he got a transfer to Colorado, and they said, you can have our house, you can have my job. And I thought, this is great, because then I can make some money to come back to Minnesota to work for the summer at the Scenic before I go to Oregon for a bit of free school. But I really, um, so I said yes, and I really fell in love with it. It was just quiet, I was by myself. It was something that I had been asking for. Mm -hmm. I felt like I could hear myself think and process and then I thought, well, maybe I'll just stay through the summer and I'll go directly from Florida to Oregon Mm -hmm. in the fall. And so that spring, I was just painting at night kind of in my off time. And the photographer and his wife, who's also an artist, kind of like discovered these paintings. He got his, his, um, photography paper in these giant wooden boxes Mm -hmm. because he shot large format. And so I was taking these wooden boxes out of the dumpster and just, you know, it was a large flat surface and it was free. So they discovered some of these um, and they said, you're an artist? What What are you doing? Well, they didn't know that I had this litany of excuses of why I would never be an artist. When Mm -hmm. people had asked me prior, I would say really um, dumb things such as artists are selfish, Mm -hmm. artists, you know, I want to give back to the community, artists are solitary creatures, like I'm I'm extroverted, I want to work with people, Um, you know, artists are starving and I would like to have money and not be starving. You know, I just had all these lists of why that would never Mm -hmm. ever be a good fit for me. But then these successful artists with two galleries, 12 employees, they gave me insurance on my very first day of Mm -hmm. being on the job. Um, They, they got their start by partnering with, conservation agencies around Florida. So all the things, you know, partnering with the community, making money, um, being joyful, being personable, like they had all of those Mm -hmm. things. And so they just said, we, we really believe in your gift. And this is sort of crazy that you're not doing anything with it. And we got our start by doing art festivals. Can we, mentor you and we've got the art bands we've got everything that you need we'll just set you up and you can see what happens so I said okay I'm going to do this artist thing but I have to totally you like you have to totally bless me because I have to know that this is you so that first art festival I do like I gotta know hands down this is it sure enough my first festival was extremely successful I sold a ton of work. It was just very, very clear Mm -hmm. that that's what I was to do. And so that was the beginning. That was 2004. And then I just took off and went full time into the arts. And then I knew this is who I am. Mm -hmm. It was so clear. I was Mm -hmm. like, I can't breathe. And then I really knew that I was an artist through and through. And I think it even sort of caught people by surprise. Other artists would say, like, well, I created, but, you know, they'd be hesitant to take mm-hmm. sort of that name. Like, it's hard to hard to call yourself. Right. I mean, there are a lot of 
like you were saying, like kind of social um, judgments, for lack of a better word, that get attached to the idea of being an artist, unless, you know, you have achieved something or in a certain type of spotlight. But I remember being told um, when I was working at the Boston Children's Museum as like a science educator, and there was an art educator there, and we were talking, but then the president of the museum came by and said kind of offhandedly, like, well, artists are people who want to change the world but can't, who don't have the skill to. And that, like, embedded itself in my brain as this, like, okay, artists are these impractical people who want to make change but don't have the skills to. And it has taken years to shed that be to, to come to the realization that artists are the people who want to change the world and create the vision that allows it to happen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. There is a, there's a lot of different ways why people have a hard time just accepting that word mm -hmm. as a part of who they are. But the more that I do this, the more it's very obvious to me everyone is an artist mm -hmm. and we need to sort of shift away from not calling ourselves artists mm -hmm. into calling ourselves artists. So what an amazing yeah. story. Well, I'm really I don't know anything about encaustics. Okay. How did you learn about encaustic originally? When I was in college, I was in a sculpture class and we had to create a non-representational painting mm -hmm. and then transfer that into sculpture. And one of the painting materials was kind of a griddle type thing mm -hmm. with old Christmas candles thrown into it. And so take the brush into the wax, throw it all over this canvas and then it would cool and then you could scrape into it. Um, and then my professor said, and I, and I was really, really enjoying it. My professor said, you know, there's an actual medium it's 3,000 years old. It's called encaustic. The Egyptians painted their funerary portraits mm -hmm. with it. It's like a legit thing. You should look it up. So um, a few, few years later, I was, I ended up in the Everglades. Yeah. And I was like in, in the woods. And I thought I should look up that encaustic process. And there was one book at the time on it. This is 2003. And I got this book and I was like a little mad scientist and I put all the ingredients together in my little trailer and the <laughs> <laughs> and started painting in encaustic. And encaustic is all about heat. Okay. Fusing layers. It's fascinating because there's so many things you can do. You can embed I'll show you, but mm -hmm. it can be very painterly if you just straight paint. But it's also incredibly conducive to mixed media materials. So you can embed things. Mm -hmm. You can carve things. You can build up. You can reduce all sorts of things. So I'm just gently laying down a layer of wax. And one layer at a time is best. Yeah. So you layer one. One go. All right, for pyromaniacs. Use it with a little heat. Okay. You see how the surface changes. And then you continue to add layers. And in my process, it's just very playful um, in the beginning. Because a lot of what you do at first gets buried. Mm -hmm. So... A little mystery. Nobody knows what's under there but you. Yeah, how do you think about that? Do you, are you purposeful? I mean, you're playful, but do you have an idea of what it's going, what is going to be buried under there and how it's going to influence the final painting or do you just let it come? No, it depends on what I'm working on. So in general, my process is very intuitive in that mm -hmm. I don't know where it's going, and I just follow the path, and things emerge and, uh, and evolve. Like In a nonlinear manner, just like we were talking about. <laughs> very nonlinear. Non and my oil paintings, for sure, 
end up that way. Mm -hmm. And with Encaustic, if I'm doing a series, like last year I did a lot of Boundary Waters pieces, mm -hmm. then I might get into a flow where I'm still very loose, but maybe I have a little more um, a clear idea of the color palette. Mm -hmm. It's really fun to play and experiment and just see like, oh, what's going to happen? What's going to show up? As you paint. It feels like a good practice. I know, as you know, I paint a little bit, not particularly well. And for me, even though I know that you need to like build up the layers and that gives the dimension and whatnot, I have trouble burying my layers. <laughs> so I love to see this is like a part, it's such an important part of the process. And it is kind of like reflective of life too, mm -hmm. where you have all these pieces buried that might not be visible on the surface, but that are giving it structure. In my artist statement, I have always kept this line from Agnes Martin, the painter, and she says, to be an artist is to surrender. Mm -hmm. There's so much surrendering that has to happen. It's inevitable. You just, you can't, you can't hold on to things. Over the years as I've worked, I just have found that it's actually the work is coming to me. Mm -hmm. And it sort of has a life of its own. And so then I might recognize it. So I sort of live its own, let it live its own life. So I don't really, I wouldn't even really call it like holding on. Like, you know, there's definitely artists right now. I'm taking those drawing classes mm -hmm. at Great Lakes Academy of Fine Art. And that is a methodology for sure. You are going after an end product. Mm -hmm. And I, that's really good practice for me. Mm -hmm. And it definitely like hones a skill that doesn't come naturally, but the way that I, <laughs> the way that I work, it's just like <laughs> something will emerge Yeah, and then I'll follow it. It's like, oh, you want me to follow you? And then I will. You're such a multifaceted creator, right? Like you do sculpture, you do mixed media, you do oil, you're drawing now. Yes. Uh, and the, the beautiful thing about it. You write poetry. Is, it can take all those things. Yeah. You know, I'm able to incorporate all those things. All these tools, you know, if I wanted to give texture to this piece, I could come over here and carve this out. Once you carve, you can take oil paint and go back in and fill in little lines. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. We're doing printmaking into encaustics. So. Okay. So I made my little fish prints, embedded them or stamped them onto Japanese paper, and then you can see put them into the encaustic. Mm -hmm. There we go. Cool, huh? There we go. I love this stuff. Yeah, I love the. I mean, there's like a real sense of abundance almost maximalism with all these like techniques and layers and things like that yes. but I feel like you're also so good at being measured and being aware of negative space and stillness within your work even amidst all of that you know what? that is I, I and I appreciate that and I that resonates with me too mm -hmm. because somehow there's a lot of energy and there's generally a lot of color mm -hmm. there still ends up being an element of peace yeah like can all come together somehow <laughs> this is a classic piece so i used all these this is a project kind of celebrating my finnish heritage mm -hmm. i used all of these marimekko prints and incorporated them in the wax some of them are napkins like that yeah thin Paper will just absorb into the wax. Some are transfers. This was gold leaf that I etched on top. Mm -hmm. And then I took all these old models from the 50s, 60s, yes. and 70s and used these like power babes. <laughs> this is just very painterly. These are big pieces. These are mm -hmm. like four by three. I think this is five by three. Um, with a lot of like incising in those little waves. I incorporate a lot of natural materials. Mm -hmm. This is another, just another way to use encaustic. 
gold leaf. It's really fun with encaustic. The gold no, leaf makes me think too of um, medieval, you know, illuminated art and um, as such a good fit for kind of the texture and makes me think of illumination on vellum and yes. all of that stuff. Yes. It just and I so think cool. symbolically, you know, that was the way to communicate the divine. Like, yeah. There was no other material that comes as close to encapsulating an energy mm -hmm. light. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that still resonates with people, even if they don't have the language or they mm -hmm. don't know why. It is a draw to what's good and beautiful in the world. So tell me about this idea to interview artists yes. and, and to get into their spaces. Like, what is that all about? So I have had, I don't know, I've had this like phrase stuck in my head of the art of the aperitif yes. um, for the last couple of years. And I haven't, it just feels, I don't know, it's just like blonde into my head and I yes. haven't known what to do with it. And um, I think it's because I've been thinking about just different ways of approaching art and different styles of artistry and what it means to live artistically and the dynamic between art and craft and you know over overthinking all of these things um with regards to life but also what I do which is like craft I would say crafting beverages but I also you know think and talk sometimes about how there's, there's an artistic intent behind everything that we make, um, where it is, there's more of an expression, there's more uh, of like a personal creative flair and storytelling piece to everything mm -hmm. we make, rather than just like a, I'm going to make something that is going to appeal to people and replicate it over and over again. Yes. Um, and this is like the soul of your work, because... It is storied, and there are connections, and every connection has layers. Yes. That's a big piece of my work. Is it, it what's so insane is that I ended up using a medium that you have to paint in layers. Mm -hmm. And so there's the physicality of the layers and the materialism of the layers. But for my own, like, spirit and heart, it's all about the layers mm -hmm. of meaning. And that's what gives the depth and the richness, that oomph, and yeah, I think that's exactly uniqueness. what you guys are doing. And I tried to, yeah, right? Like, I can do that when I'm creating a drink, and, and everything is kind of layered in there, and nothing might stand out like, oh, my God, there's, you know, chocolate bitters in there. Um, but it's layered in there for a reason, because it kind of creates this whole. Um, Successful businesses, to me, are the ones that can find a way to merge mm -hmm. the arts with let's even call it commerce market. Margaret mm -hmm. Atwood calls it, like, for artists, like, walking the valley of the shadow of commerce, which it feels like it does. <laughs> really painful, and that tension of the arts with how do we bring this to the market and how does it continue to stay true and not, like, we're selling out or we're shaving anything off that has meaning, you know, how do we get all those elements to stay mm -hmm. and then sort of turn into something that the machine can handle you know the machine can't handle a lot of things that are yeah used to. so to be very um you know methodic methodical <laughs> about how we get into that right shape for yeah. the market and you guys do that really well oh thank you yeah. <laughs> um we saw ourselves as creators, mm -hmm. we would rise up to that sort of idea of like, things are just better if they're layered. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's richer, it's more meaningful. And so if you looked at yourself that way, with it almost a duality, like I am all these things and I'm a creator mm -hmm. and I'm an artist. And it just almost gives like a little more oomph and validity to your ideas, which is what we need. Mm -hmm. We don't need monoculture, we need Tons of raging, off-the-wall ideas. Yes. And we're like, this is where fun magic happens. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit about your creative process. Where do you find inspiration? Mm -hmm. Things sort of come to me, and then 
I just find myself, you know, I'm thinking about them all the time. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about them all the time. And even this last, uh, last, not the last body work, but I would say a show that I did this winter was called Interstice. It really kind of captured the last maybe three to five years of my studio practice in terms of um, disciplines, you know, there was just a, there was sculpture and there was oil painting and there was fantastic, there was poetry, there was a there was a lot of elements in there that felt really resonant with you know what I've been playing and working in. But then it was also thinking so much about technology and being online and I think that was just part of being an artist is that we're observant. Mm -hmm. And so artists also stand at the edge, edges of things. And it's fun in a way that artists can easily move in and out of different realms and spheres. So then you, you're observing in all these different realms and spheres of you know, society or even within your community. Um, um, sometimes I may chase something down, but a lot of times it it will come to me. Um, I think geography is important for me too, even like going to Mexico. And so once I'm there, I think it's sort of the, you know, like embodying you know, the landscape that you're in, mm -hmm. and then somehow it comes out onto the canvas or panel in a more pure way for me. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing with my work in Everglades. It's the same thing with Northern Minnesota. And so hopefully Iceland is my next place that I'll get to go. And yeah, it seems like a lot of your work is very place-based. You know, it is kind of representative of places, but then you have other work that feels much more abstract mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. patterned or like mm -hmm. layer pattern and kind of like <laughs> symbolic imagery. And uh, is that intent, like an intentional balance of doing both? Is it, it's just what comes? It's just what comes. Yeah. It's just, and there's, you know, again, in that non-linear way, I think at the end of my life, when you look at my body of work, it will feel cohesive and it will all make sense and right now I'm just sort of adding to that like spiral of, of why I was made and what I need to create with my life you know mm -hmm. so so this show that I did before in Tristis was like how do we stay human how do we rehumanize in a dehumanizing landscape and it's heavy to talk about and mm -hmm. people actually don't want to talk about it it's too much actually, want it is too much because it's overwhelming and we already know like yeah something about this whole digital lifestyle there's something that's not right mm -hmm. we don't know what it is we feel like well we're too far in and we're too drawn in and this is just the way it is and so here we are so there's a sort of powerlessness mm -hmm. that i find that we don't want to address it's just easier not to and so it was healing for me to go through all that, but to get people to engage with it wasn't as, they weren't as interested. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> when we started this storytelling project that, you know, is set in the landscape of the North Shore, which we all love so much, you know, people are just naturally drawn to that. And there was so much joy, there is so much joy in the stories. And I think the heaviness that's been going on in our world for the last couple of years, people are just, they're hungry for joy mm -hmm. and some levity and reprieve from the hard stuff. And I, I needed that too. So mm -hmm. I can say, oh, look in my practice, how there's got to be a rhythm that keeps me afloat. You know, I can dive into harder subject matters for a period of time, but then I've got to like come up for air and, and do something later. So I think there's probably a rhythm in there too. Mm -hmm. Non-linear rhythm, mm -hmm. but it's there is some kind of pattern. Yeah, right and non-prescriptive, but it's such a it's a good illustration of how 
Yeah, it's not either or, it's not one or the other. There's a there's a flow, there's yeah. a wave between those things that allow them to support each other and yeah. like, coexist beautifully. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like it's so it's so fun to hear you talk about just kind of like the process and the trust and like, you know, just doing the things. Um I know it's very easy to get or at least less personalized. For me, I very easily struggle with like something has to be practical or it has to, you know, be successful in a certain way, like we were talking about before, otherwise it's like somehow I'm wasting energy that I may not be able to recoup or there, like we were talking about with commerce, there's a certain amount of necessity for success. <laughs> um, but also for the process, you need to have that play and that creativity and trust. Um, so do you have any tips or learnings or things that help you balance those things? That is a very good question. I, I think it's probably, <clears throat> now I'm not thinking this as I'm doing it, mm -hmm. you know, sort of unfolding and then I'm looking back. But I do really believe that the spirit of play and surrender, like really letting go, is the absolute key to successful creativity. Mm -hmm. And when I say successful, like, have you created something that you love and that resonates with you and that resonates with other people, mm -hmm. you know? So it's so backwards because you know, we left, let's say 500 years ago, we, we started pursuing rationalism. Mm -hmm. And and we have, we're morphing into like rationalism is now turning into like a straight number. Now it's about data. Mm -hmm. And so the, when I say like the machine, the empire, it, doesn't like things it can't compute. Mm -hmm. It doesn't like things it can't measure. And so creativity is one of those things that cannot be measured, cannot be monetized. You can't break it down into, into certain units and say $25 per whatever. Per ounce of creativity. <laughs> it can't be done and that frustrates the machine and that frustrates economists mm -hmm. and so to make a beautiful, precious, honor something, you, you really have to go against that sort of um, quantifiable mm -hmm. creating. So if you're going into a project like, I need to make this thing so I can make X amount of dollars or ho however you're doing that, it's, it's gonna eat away at the creative essence of that thing and I I think part of going back to like you know observing what was happening with my friends and my friends businesses as Instagram grew and as I saw people just spend more and more time online I felt like there was a strange um, not a pause in creativity, but I, it was like things started to get like really homogenous mm -hmm. in terms of trends, in terms of of what brought excitement to people and mm -hmm. inspired people. Just like how we want to decorate our home, one example. I don't know that there was ever a time where we all wanted a white room mm -hmm. with neutral pillows. Like I. You know, patterns, let's say there was a phase of patterns and wallpapers, but they were varied and different and could still sort of communicate what was beautiful to a particular person. Mm -hmm. And so that has that has been off-putting to me a little bit and concerning. Mm -hmm. Like so I would just say to artists, like if if you and creators like get into that like very deep 
raw, playful. You don't care about, like, no one, if you can imagine, no one will see this. Like, what would bring me joy and pleasure? Like, that essence is what the world needs. Mm -hmm. And out of that, the money will come, the, the needs will be met. And I'm also wired, um, it's to my advantage, but the deep faith that things will work out and, and that I will make the money that I, that I need to make. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, there's always that tension for artists. You do have to figure out how to pay your bills and how much time you need to spend online and all that rigmarole. But I think it's the core, it's like the tapping into playfulness mm -hmm. and believing that that's the thing that needs to get brought into the world. Mm -hmm. Love that. And it, yeah, just taking that lens of being like, I'm mean, gonna pretend nobody's ever gonna see this. Yes. And I'm, or not even pretend. Let's start with the assumption nobody's ever gonna see yes. this. What do I want to create? Yes. And then if later you choose to put it out there. Yeah. Yeah. And awesome. I don't know, like, <laughs> you know, are there ways that we could set ourselves up for that experience being more successful? Like, I'm gonna work in the project for 24 hours. 24 actual hours, mm -hmm. you know, before I start to think about like how this can fit in the marketplace, mm -hmm. you know, but is there, maybe there's ways to sort of set up a framework to stay in that place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about for you? How did you do that? Um, cause you're so creative. I mean, I think about like your backyard parties, <laughs> your cocktails, your painting, your ballet, your cooking. Yeah. You know, like there's, you're so creative and yet you found a way to sort of, you know, get them out into the market in a really human, beautiful way. So how do you do it? How do I do it? How do you do it? That's very kind of you because I don't feel successful at it on an ongoing basis. I think it it's a similar process of trying to tap into this idea of like, well, maybe it, nobody will ever see this or I'll never show this to anybody. And I do a lot of work kind of in that space. And then at the last minute, I'm like, okay, actually people are coming over, surprise me. And then I go into panic mode um, and then <laughs> do it, right? Or like you create the cocktails and then you're like, oh, well, actually we're releasing a menu, surprise me. Um, <laughs> Um, and I think, yeah, I think as a business owner, there is a lot of time where I have to think like, wh what is the return on investment for this? But if I'm thinking that all the time, it does, it, it numbs the creativity, it kills the joy and the playfulness. And so I have to make things and then say, after the fact, we can figure out how to, you know, break it into pieces yeah. that, you know, give me a return on investment. Yeah. But I'm going to kind of try to separate the creative process from that and business process and do them as, as, as partners instead of trying to um, make it one and the same. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. You do really well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and I think everyone that knows and sort of like gets a, you know, maybe a little more intimate glimpse into your life and how you manage to really do all the things and juggle all the things. There's just like such a vitality there that draws people. Wow, thank you. Yeah, I think I think trying to have fun and respecting fun and joy as like critical parts of life, not frivolous parts of life, like is so important. It's has to be there. Yeah. The element of play has to be yeah. there. Yeah. Right, you have to. And I think, right, there's there's an important place for data. There's an important place for the hypothesis testing and um, statistics and all that stuff. There's an important place for that. But there's also, like, really important, wonderful places where it's like, well, that's, that's actually going to stop the discovery. Right, we're never going to look at that thing because we're taking this very narrow lens yeah. or calculated yeah. lens. It reminds me too, like we don't have to be all things, mm -hmm. and I think that's the temptation. Our 
day and age too. Like you gotta be the videographer and the mixologist and the mom. And you know, it's like, well, I think the design is that we're to do life and community. And so mm-hmm. my weaknesses, maybe they're your strengths. Mm-hmm. And if we're working together, we're both gonna be happier and we're gonna get more done and it's gonna be done in a better way, mm-hmm. to in a more quality way because we're willing to be vulnerable and say <laughs> I'm really bad at this. I'm like really bad. So, you know, like who can come alongside me that doesn't mind doing that? Mm -hmm. Who loves it? Right? Who gets joy out of the quick books? That's sort of where I'm now. I'm like, I gotta hunt those people down. Mm -hmm. Any final words of wisdom? I can share a moral. Yes, let's share a moral. There's so many good morals in here, but speaking of aging, um, I'd like to share a moral from The Adventures of Grandma Ray. Life need not dull with age, but being brightly with adventure and snacks. Snacks. Beverages. And, yes. Tasty tipples. Tasty tipples. <laughs> So, I love it. Let's have snacks and friends, and then we'll just friends. figure, like, out. And have a theme party together. Yeah. <laughs> That's the answer. Exactly. No dullness.